the world is teeming with stories. Some teach about our understanding of the outside world. Others convey how peoples of the past understood it. Still others tell of what the world could be if we open our eyes to the magic in every corner. Minecraft worlds, however, often lack any explicit stories, despite having just as many to tell as the real world. I dream of a Minecraft filled with writings. This is a series of videos in which I write and format books set in Minecraft for you to use in your worlds without any restrictions. For those who share my dream, let me build you a tale of a storied library. DIY for Dilettantes, updated 1.20 edition, by Jacob McFarland. Intro. I will not be the first to admit that life is not properly explained. There is no tutorial, just an open world and your drive to explore. But not to worry, I, Jacob McFarland, am here to be the tutorial instead. With the book in your hands, you can learn how to use tools both mundane and magical to craft weapons, armor, and more. Let's get started. Crafting table. Crafting tables are one of the easiest blocks to create, but by far the most useful. To get started, combine four wooden planks into a cube. The golden rule of crafting is that the crafting ingredients must be exactly the same distance from each other. Once you nail the distances, the planks should combine into a crafting table. Plop that sucker on the ground, because now, instead of having to eyeball an even distance between ingredients, a feat so difficult you can only reliably craft 2x2 two two recipes, you can use the built-in grid on the top of the table. Use the tools on the side of the table to ensure stability in your products. You can use others' recipes or come up with your own whenever you see an interesting plant or stone out in nature. Just remember to write all your recipes down in your recipe book. That's the one with the green binding. Stone cutter. Sometimes crafting tables can be a bit clunky. You might end up having to waste portions of blocks that you remove in the process of getting another. If that's a problem for you, try using a stone cutter. Use three stone blocks in a row with an iron ingot fashioned into a blade atop the middle, and you'll get yourself this extremely useful block. Don't worry about the spinning saw. It can only hurt stones. You can use it to carve any stone-like block into stairs, slabs, bricks, and other variations. You won't ever want to go back to cumbersome crafting after using this block. Furnaces. There are three types of furnaces, each with different strengths, but all employ the same basic principles. Each furnace has a top half and a bottom half, which may have two separate input slots or one opening with an internal division. Fuel, that's pretty much anything flammable or hot. Coal, logs, lava, blaze rods, old wooden tools, you name it. It's placed in the bottom, and whatever you wish to heat goes into the top slot. Once everything is set up, the furnace will light itself. General furnaces, crafted with a ring of cobbled stones, can smelt or cook anything. Blast furnaces, crafted with a furnace inside an iron shell with a smooth stone base, get up to higher temperatures so they can smelt ore as quickly but will simply burn any food placed inside. Don't put food inside. Smokers, crafted with four logs around a furnace, are the coolest of the three and are excellent for cooking food, but they can't reach the temperatures required to smelt ores. Of course, if you don't want to use any fuel, you can always roast your food around a campfire, but those require constant attention. Some people I know say that your choice of furnace says a lot about you as a person, and I think that's a load of mushroom dung. Hopper. A block often used in conjunction with furnaces is the hopper. They are made with six iron ingots cradling a chest, and they pull in items, either loose or in another container, a chest, furnace, or another hopper, from their wider section, then funnel them out the narrower section into another container. Hoppers have five slots in the top to store items that come in, but they only feed out items from one section at a time, switching slots only when their current slot is empty. Hoppers can be used to auto-feed any items into chests, fuel or smeltables into furnaces, compostable items into composters, or even music discs into jukeboxes. They're very useful in all sorts of contraptions. Lectern. A very simple block that functions as a stand for books to be read from, lecterns are made by topping any type of slab with first a bookshelf and then a line of three slabs of any type balanced across its center. It's common courtesy to rewind the book on a lectern when you're finished reading it so the next reader doesn't have to. That's it. That's all I have to say about lecterns. Um, maybe you could put this book on a lectern. Okay, moving on. 
Loom. If you love art, this is the DIY block for you. Using two planks of any kind and two strings, you can fashion yourself a loom and then fashion yourself the trendiest fashions. Well, not armor fashions per se, that's another block. Looms help you make banner and shield patterns. This block is very intuitive. Simply pull out one of the various gray rimmed stencils from the racks, place it over a banner, and rub a dye of your choice onto the banner through the holes in the stencil. This will dye the banner with the color and pattern you chose. With the right blueprints, you can even make your own stencils in the shape of flowers, skulls, and more. Folks can get very creative with these, although the most I've ever managed to do is make a mangled mess. Let me take this opportunity to thank my friend Steve McClelland for giving me a beautiful banner to use as a map marker for my home. I wouldn't be able to chart the world without you, buddy. Speaking of maps, let's next examine a block that can improve your cartography workflow. Cartography table. Being of the exploration line, the cartography table is quite literally my favorite block. Crafted with four of any planks underneath two sheets of paper, this block allows you to easily modify maps. You can add extra paper to an existing map to make it bigger, you can copy maps, and you can even lock maps with a glass pane to preserve map art or natural landscapes before um, making changes. I always carry one of these with me. You never know when you might come across unexplored chunks. Smithing table. The smithing table has recently been discovered to have significantly more use than previously thought, prompting me to write an updated edition of this book. To craft one, use two iron ingots atop four of any planks. Then, the block can be used either to upgrade diamond armor to netherite, or to encrust armor of any type with a brilliant trim of gold, iron, diamond, netherite, emerald, amethyst, quartz, redstone, prismarine, copper, or lapis lazuli, provided that you've got the templates to do so. Templates are single-use tablets with engraved designs that can be mapped onto any armor piece. Using the hammer on the side of the smithing table, Crush or ply your desired trim or upgrade material into a shape that fills the grooves in the template, and then gently unwrap the template so that it covers the armor you want to upgrade. Let the smithing table self-heat so that the trim or upgrade is bound to the armor, and finally, peel off the template with the smithing table's pliers. And there you go, one upgraded or trimmed armor piece. Be sure to copy the template by engraving the design onto another block beforehand if you want to keep it though, because going through this process destroys the template. Containers. Once you've crafted items with a myriad of blocks described above, you're going to want somewhere to put them. Chests, which can be crafted with eight of any planks in a ring, are a classic solution to the storage conundrum. Underneath their lids, you'll find they look much like your backpack. They're divided into 18 9 by 3, sectors, each the full depth of the chest. You can pack up to 64 blocks of dirt or stone into one segment, but for more complex items like swords or beds, you can only really squish one into each slot. If you want to have a bigger chest, you can knock out the wall on one side of the chest and add another 18 slots of storage onto the side, creating a double chest. Can't really get any bigger than that without the lid buckling in the middle though. If you're looking for a more compact storage system, try the barrel. Crafted with six of any planks flanking two of any wooden slabs, these containers have a removable lid, as opposed to chests hinged one. This means they can be opened in tighter spaces, like with the block right above them, unlike chests, but they also can't combine with nearby barrels. If you find yourself wanting something a bit more private, surround an eye of ender with eight obsidian to get an ender chest. This baby stores things in a pocket dimension that only you can access, and you can do so from anywhere in the world as long as you have one of these. Very convenient for keeping your things away from prying eyes. If you want to expand the storage capacity of your ender chest or backpack, you can use a shulker box. These shells of shulkers surrounding a chest compress a whole 18 storage spaces into one. You can even dye them different colors for easier item management. Just promise me you won't Try to put a shulker box inside another shulker box. Nothing good will happen. Okay? Okay. Basics of magic. The following blocks are all related to magical phenomena, so I would like to cover the basics of magic before we continue. First of all, all magic requires energy, also known as experience points. Energy can be collected from many sources, such as mining ores or killing mobs. All spells cost some amount of energy, and some spells require you to have a high base level of energy before you can cast them. Once you understand energy, you'll be good. Some say that there's an ancient coder line that has the ability to use magic that doesn't draw from energy, but that sounds like a witch's tale to me. 
Anvil. Anvils are tricky blocks to get the hang of, but all their functions revolve around one feature, the hammer and chisel attached to its side. These tools are made of iron, a metal with an affinity for magic, so each use requires energy. With the hammer and chisel, you can carve text into the handle of a tool, the back of your armor, or a name tag, which bestows each item with a name. Additionally, you can use them to combine two of the same type of tool together, and because of the magical nature of the hammer and chisel, any enchantments bestowed upon the objects will be combined as well. Finally, the hammer and chisel can be used to break open the sturdy seal on enchanted books. Once the seal is broken, speak the words in the book out loud. This will cost energy, consume the book, and apply any relevant enchantments on its cover to the object on the anvil. The more powerful the enchantments on the items you are dealing with, the more energy the enchantment processes will sap from you. Trying to place too many spells on one item will overwhelm even the mightiest of mages. One final note. Unlike other blocks discussed in this book, anvils will become damaged the more you use them. One slab of iron can only take so many beatings from a hammer and chisel. Don't expect the three iron blocks and four iron ingots in the shape of a T it takes to make an anvil to last you forever. Anvils are very useful, but they can be costly. Use them with caution. Grindstone. Anvils are a tricky block to understand, but grindstones are much simpler. Grindstones are made of a stone slab placed between two sticks which are above two planks of any kind. This rock does not attract energy as well as the iron of the hammer and chisel, so it cannot fuse enchanted objects with others, but using it to mend two like objects will actually dispel the enchantments and return the energy to you. I just think of the grindstone as a lesser anvil, but eh, if you like it, that's cool. Enchanting Table This is one of two blocks in this book that needs other blocks to properly function. To craft the enchanting table, four obsidian and an upside-down T is needed, topped with two diamonds and one book. The book used in crafting will be filled with the text of the most basic spells, but in order to find more powerful ones, you'll need to collect bookshelves and place them around the table. To cast a spell, you must first offer a bit of lapis lazuli to the table, which will then present you with three options of enchantments to place upon your object. No pattern has yet been found on what spells the enchanted table offers and when, but more powerful spells will always require you to have more energy to begin with and to sacrifice more energy and lapis lazuli. Only strong sorcerers with enough self-control can use the strongest spells. Brewing Stand Brewing potions is a different type of magic that I have no affinity for. My friend Scorpion McDougal, on the other hand, has considerable experience in the art. Please refer to their book potions for pupils for more information on this topic. If you would like to experiment with potions yourself, a brewing stand can be crafted with one blaze rod atop three cobblestone. Beacon. Don't feel like using your energy? Try using the energy of souls that have come before you. All you gotta do is fight a wither, get its star-shaped core, slap it in a glass prism with an obsidian base, and voila! You've crafted a magic radiating beacon. Beacons do require a bit more to properly harness the soul energy from the nether star, however. A pyramid of precious materials, iron, gold, emerald, diamond, or netherite blocks will do, is needed to channel the soul energy from the beacon out into the surrounding area. The larger the pyramid, the further the energy will travel out and down from the beacon. It will travel up as far as the beacon's beam does, and the more powerful effects the beacon will be able to produce. This is because energy is greedy, so to speak. It wants to bind itself to precious materials, and although it slightly prefers some materials over others, gold over netherite over diamond, etc., when in such high volumes as it takes to create a powered beacon, it will have the same effect no matter what material you provide it. But enough with the lecture, let's get to the good stuff. Beacons make you stronger. Any person within range of the beacon gets an effect, or two if the beacon pyramid is large enough, from speed or haste to resistance, strength, or jump boost. A large enough beacon pyramid can even provide access to regeneration or a higher level of the aforementioned abilities. When you first turn on your beacon, you'll notice it doesn't know what effect to provide you. It's like an LA. You have to train it on what to do before it can do it. To get it to listen, hold a bit of one of the materials you could use for the base and its beam, then say the name of the effect you want. The beam will disintegrate the item, and the beacon will start cranking out those effects. Enjoy your soul-powered benefits! Further study. There is one additional block that appears like it should have some functionality, but no one I have ever met has been able to make it work. Like many other blocks previously mentioned, it is crafted with four of any plank topped with two other ingredients, in this case flint. This fletching table holds bows, arrows, feathers, and targets around its midsection, and it seems like it should allow one to meddle with their archery equipment, but again, no one knows how it works. 
we have seen Fletcher villagers using it to craft tipped arrows, but although my friend Steve has asked them how they get the block to work, they can't demonstrate it in any useful way. I wrote this book to collect the knowledge of generations on how to create and use blocks and pass it on to new spawns. Maybe one day, you can add to it with a chapter all about fletching tables. For now, its feathers make it a good place to grab writing quills from, if nothing else. Conclusion. I hope this book has helped you novices understand the various blocks you may discover a bit better. With the tools of carpentry, masonry, and magic under your metaphorical belt, you can now walk into life with confidence. Interested in learning more? Check out my other title, My Life Among Villagers, and Steve McClellan's work, including The Care and Feeding of Your Dragon and Architecture for Amateurs. Have fun exploring out there! Jacob McFarland, signing off. Okay, and that concludes our story for today. This was the first non-fiction book in our library, or, you know, as non-fiction as Minecraft gets. Um, and it's one that I've had cooking for a long time. I think I want to say eight years? Yeah, <laughs> that's insane. Obviously the book has been changed since that original writing because new blocks have come out, blocks have been changed, etc. This is referenced in canon by the little updated 1.20 edition sticker on the front of the book. Um, not to say that they canonically know what updates are, but I do think this book has had 1.2 updates. <laughs> Also, I know that's not how looms work in real life. Minecraft looms are weird, and I thought stencils was the best way to explain them, but I know looms in real life, you weave the colors into the banner or whatever you're making the fabric. Um, at the time of creation, you don't put paint on top of it, but I mean, Minecraft looms do add color afterward. They don't add color during the banner creation process, so I mean, how else do you explain it? Anyway, I'm sorry this took forever to come out. It takes me far too long to actually get my stuff together and make one of these, but I hope you enjoyed it. With that, peace be with you folks. I will see you at another time. Interested in learning more? Check out my other title, My Life Among Villagers. No, that's not his title. 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 Is it his title? I think he, I think he has the